Hello world, I'm your host, Adam Mining Mike, and on today's episode of the podcast, we're going to talk about, is recycling a profitable industry? We have a very fascinating guest today. Her name is Jess Simpkins. Jess is a community organizer, blogger, entrepreneur, and former medical doctor. She is very well researched in this field and sees acres of diamonds that most people simply throw away. They're glass. The glass can be converted back down into sand and used as a raw material in multiple industrial applications. I am highly confident at the end of this period of instruction, you will be able to take what you have learned and be more informed. And that's called value. And because of that, you should like this video. Remember that sharing is caring. Check out all of Jess's information in the video description below. Subscribing is what winners do, but smashing the bell, that's what legends do. This channel breeds legends. But first, let's explore how profitable the trash collection industry is with Waste Management Stock, ticker symbol WM. Waste Management is a Fortune 500 company, and it's the largest waste management company in terms of revenue and market capitalization in the United States and is one of the largest integrated trash service providers on the planet. Waste Management, ticker symbol WM. Jess, Jess, tell the world about you. Hello, it's good to be here. Thank you for having me on. Um, so a little bit about me. I am a doctor turned founder of a nonprofit called Let's Build a Community and fairly new to the Spokane area, but super excited to be able to spread the news about glass recycling in the area and how we can come together as a community to turn our areas of waste into opportunity. Nice. So tell us about that. How did you get started? What was the idea? Yeah. So originally when I started, I was living in Norwich, Connecticut, which is a tiny town. I think we got turned off here. Okay. No, it's all good. It's, oh. It keeps recording. Cool. Okay. It just goes. To, yeah. Um, but yeah, so Norwich, Connecticut and Norwich is not unlike a lot of different cities in the U.S. where it's struggling with not having that same economic opportunity that it used to have. So I think they used to be like a big whaling industry. Obviously that's not a thing anymore. And so everywhere you look, you have a lot of abandoned like uh, industrial buildings and things like that. And issues with homelessness, obviously not as bad as Spokane, but just that sense of a loss of community there and a loss of economic opportunity for the people that live there. And so that was really striking to me. And I was at a co-working space at the time, surrounded by people that were actively trying to bring more excitement and growth into the community. And so that concept of building community was really important to me and kind of started to trickle in through there. Um, and that's also why I left medicine in a way is because I was so disillusioned with this lack of community, this lack of responsibility that I thought we all had. Um, not just in the healthcare setting, but like as um, people that live in the United States, right? Of this sense of responsibility to one another. Um, so that was kind of the inspiration for the base of the, the, the nonprofit. And then from there, I was really inspired by other nonprofits that are doing some really amazing things in waste management. Um, in particular, there's um, these two badass people, they were like college seniors at Tulane that started Glass Half Full in New Orleans. Um, and they started processing glass in their backyard and now they have a whole uh, setup where they're processing all of New Orleans glass and then some. And I've just always been really interested in how can we take things that we throw away that are perfectly usable or reusable or recyclable and how can we take that waste and actually turn it into something that is valuable. Um, and in particular for those of us that live in that area. So not just, you know, outsourcing it to somebody else and, and having them take advantage of that, but how can we as a community take advantage of these resources that we're not taking advantage of? Yeah. yeah. And at what cost too? Yeah, exactly. 
That's exactly. Something people don't realize is the cost, the hidden cost. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So where have you, where do you see the direction this is going? Yeah. So we started um, kind of a needs assessment first in Spokane County. Um, there was a report by the Department of Commerce in 2020 for all of Washington talking about the glass issue in Washington. And um, one of the biggest challenges that we don't recognize in the United States is that up until like 2018, we were sending all of our recyclables abroad to a lot of Asian countries and China in particular. And in 2018, China passed this, I don't know if bill's the right word, but basically saying you have to meet certain standards for um, cleanliness for these recyclables. And if, if you're not doing that, we're not going to keep importing them. And in the U.S., like, we're not very good at um, separating out our recyclables and preventing contamination of them and things like that. And so a lot of our recyclables in the U.S. were no longer being accepted by these countries. And so even though a lot of people think that we're recycling things, you know, recycling centers might be taking them, but they're not the ones actively doing the recycling process. And so if if there's no buyers in that area for those things, it's it's being thrown in the landfill. And people are paying for that too, right? We're paying to then have these things put in the landfill. So after doing our needs assessment, we realized, you know, in Spokane County in particular, all of our glass is going in the landfill. It's not being used in really any beneficial way. Um, and in part because the closest processing facility is in Seattle. Um, and we used to pay as a community to have that sent there, but now with the cost of gas and transportation, like it's just not economically viable to do that anymore. So we as an organization want to tackle that challenge of what can we be doing with our glass here locally in Spokane County, maybe you know a broader sense of Eastern Washington, even Idaho with Kootenai County. And we're looking at kind of a multi-pronged approach of talking with different local businesses that use glass bottles regularly, like different food and beverage businesses like your wineries, and seeing is there a market for us to pull these glass bottles that are intact, sanitize them, and and sell them back to them for a fee, right? Um, Because glass bottles and containers, on average, can be washed and reused like more than 20 times before they show any kinds of wear and tear. Um, Other things that we're looking at are collaborating with our local artists in the area to use some of the glass for really beautiful works of art um, and home goods. So like there are great videos on YouTube of people turning wine bottles into glasses. Um, You can crush glass down and mix it with cement or resin and create terrazzo products, which are really beautiful pieces that for tables or ceramic pots or whatever. Um, And then the third approach is really to deal with the scale of glass waste that we have in the area, but pulverization. So taking whatever waste glass that we have, pulverizing it into safe to handle sand and gravel. So the equipment we're looking at gets rid of all the sharp edges. So it's totally safe to, to handle once it's been pulverized. And there are so many different applications for that once you've gotten to that phase. So um, a few of the things that have been done in other places, you can sub up to 20% of cement with glass sand. You can use it um, in asphalt to decrease some of the other things that you're putting in asphalt. You can use it for landscaping, mulching. You can mix it with compost to make soil more, uh, have better drainage. You can, there's just so many different things that you can do with that. So that, we're, right now, we're trying to get that fully visualized. Um, but then long term, where we're hoping to go is to collaborate with communities throughout the U.S. So that at least, you know, every state has something like this. Because glass is something that we are using across the United States. And there are a few places that do things with their glass. But by and large, there's a lot of places that aren't doing anything. So we would love to be able to collaborate with other communities throughout the U.S. to get the glass piece up and running and later, I know this is a lot, but also tackling other issues within waste. Um, This is a, a very lofty goal, but I would love to have the U.S. look more like Sweden as far as like our municipal solid waste goes because 
Sweden, when you look at their data, less than 1% of their waste is landfilled. The other, I think it's like 47 or 49% is recycled and then the rest is incinerated to create energy. And in the US, half of our waste is landfilled. So there's such tremendous room for improvement in that that I think is only going to benefit our communities and our country. So We'll talk about more of the applications they do in Sweden. Yeah, great. So they have a really cool process for sorting um, their municipal solid waste in Sweden. Um, and in particular, there's this one city, and I, I cannot remember the name of the city off the top of my head. Um, we can definitely add it in to the, the bio or whatever. Um, but they have the world's first secondhand mall, which I think is really interesting. And they, they have a whole mall that sits next to their recycling center. And basically, instead of bringing your used goods to the land, even if they're broken, right, to the landfill, you actually take it to your local recycling center where it's then sorted. And there's, I think, 12 or 14 different vendors that rent space in this mall. And they select based off of the the types of vendors like which items they think would be best for those vendors and the vendors refurbish them or whatever and then and sell them at their stores and so that is really cool but in addition to that they're very um very careful to sort out their waste so one of the challenges we have in the united states is we do what's called single stream recycling which is where we just throw all of our recyclables into one recycling can right where waste management or whoever comes and picks it up and it goes to a facility and the facility is tasked with sorting it out by type it's actually super inefficient um, because you have high rates of contamination then like it takes only a few people putting the wrong things in your recycling bin to screw up a lot of valuable recyclables so like in sweden they don't do it that way they have um, a system where the residents have in Sweden in general I think it's three but in this one town they have like seven different categories but they have like different colored plastic baggies that they have in their home and each color is a different waste stream so like one for metal and one for paper products and one for glass and one for food waste and then one specifically for garbage so things that you know really have no other benefit it just needs to get tossed right like baby diapers okay um, so the residents themselves are doing the sorting at home. They put all of the, they tie off all the bags, they put it into one garbage can. So you don't even need separate garbage and recycling bins at that point. They've already sorted it for you. Trucks come by, pick it up, and taking it to a sorting center where they have an optical scanner. This is so cool. They have an optical scanner. They, they like dump all of the different bags from all of the different places into a hopper. And the hopper loads the bags up onto a conveyor belt. And then an optical scanner like sees the color of each bag. And then you've got this paddle system that flips the different color bags into different chutes. And so you have a whole automated system that sorts out, you know, those different waste streams. So it's super efficient. Um, your risk of contamination is so much lower and you're really able to get the most out of your recyclables then. Um, so that's what they do. And I think that's a big part of why they're able to have such high rates of both recycling and then also the incineration, um, which I think in the U.S. we're a little bit afraid of sometimes um, because when we when we think about burning garbage, you're like, well, that seems counterproductive because we're releasing carbon into the atmosphere, right? Isn't that bad? But when you have a specialized plant, and we're lucky that we do have one here in Spokane, the waste to energy facility, um, but when you have a specialized plant that does that, you're actually... Your, your emissions are actually less compared to landfilling because you're burning it in a controlled environment in these furnaces that heat up water to generate steam, which then generates electricity for the city. Um, so again, Sweden has this figured out. It's just that we're so behind. And I think there's a lot of fear to change how things work, right? Like we've been doing things a certain way for a long time. And I think there's a lot of resistance to disrupting the status quo. Hmm. So. Okay. So what is one change you would want to see in the local neighborhood? 
Yeah. So, gosh, lots of changes. But I would love for us to start taking advantage of the local glass that we have, right? I don't think it would be that challenging, um, especially when we're talking about whole glass bottles and containers and things like that. There's just so many different things we could be doing with it. So I would, I'm really looking forward to when we're going to be able to start actively taking that from people and doing something with it and benefiting our community. Um, And just that awareness. I think I didn't realize how many people don't know, even here, that we don't have glass recycling. Um, I had kind of a back and forth debate with somebody on Facebook who was like, yeah, we do. We have glass recycling. It says on my container I can put glass Mm. in it. And I had to be like, I understand your confusion, but actually when you talk to the people at, you know, the the city's Mm. waste department, you talk to the county waste department, it's not being recycled. It is being landfilled. And so there is a lot of people that aren't aware um, that our recyclables aren't being recycled, even though we think they are. So that education piece, too, I think is really huge. Hmm. Good. That's an important point. So at this point, you are in the awareness spreading phase of your community building outreach to try to make this change happen in the county. Yeah, I feel like we're kind of doing everything at once, um, which is a little overwhelming at times, Mm -hmm. but we are. So we have, we're, we're trying to spread that awareness. That was a big part of why I wanted to go on Founders Live is to start spreading that message about that we're here and what we're trying to do. Um, we're working with the Gonzaga students with their new venture lab and they're helping us as well. Like we're giving exposure to them as a student body and we're bringing their ideas into how can we spread this message to other campuses, to other community groups. Um, and we're working on the operational piece. So we're, we're still having a lot of different conversations with different possible partners um and other groups that i think will be really interested in either the end market side of like what could be done with the glass once it's done or up front like they wanting to be more sustainable um maybe they have a lot of glass waste themselves like different local restaurants you've got northern quest or somebody that we're talking with that um want to do something with that so i would say we're we're kind of doing both. We're trying to get the word out and we're exploring some some collaborations so that we can actually take that next step and start doing things with our glass waste. Good. So what sort of outlets have you been taking for information spreading? Yeah. So admittedly, we have not been very diligent with our social media. That is one of my <laughs> goals uh, to start improving in the very near future. Um, we did have like a community meet and greet a couple months ago at one of the local restaurants up north called Cafe Boku. Um, so we kind of, we put a couple flyers out. I reached out to people that I've been in contact with, um, to come and hear more about us. Um, and we had some opportunities to have people come and learn a little bit more. So that was a great opportunity to meet some folks. And then, um, we did have a, an article in the Huckleberry Press, Um, talking about kind of our early ideas. I can't remember when that was, but it's been a few months there. Um, Just trying to, we're trying to, we started by really trying to get in touch with the people that are the closest to the source of things. So my earliest conversations were with um, a couple mayors. I actually talked with the mayor of Cheney and Medical Lake. Um, as well as the waste departments because they're the ones that like really understand the inner workings of our recycling and waste system so um, under an understanding that that flow because in Spokane County it's actually pretty complicated because you have is it like 12 or 13 different municipalities that are technically within Spokane County and each of those decides like who they're contracting out their waste to and who's doing their recycling Then you have the county itself has its own two transfer stations. Um, And then you have the private groups like you have Sunshine Disposal and Empire Disposal and then Waste Management. Mm -hmm. Um, 
so I would say up until now, we've been just really trying to understand, like, who are all these key players in our community? Um, what does that flow look like with our glass and our waste in general? Um, so we haven't, I don't feel like we've done a great job yet getting the word out, but I think that's going to be one of our next big pushes is to start sharing the information that we've gathered. Sounds like you've done a good job of collecting information about the local area and what competitors are in the space. Thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of work, but it was it was fun, too. So. Yeah, it's fun to go and talk to people. And, yes. You know, get their ideas. And so talk about of those three disposal places, which ones actually have people that walk out of the trucks and get garbage? Uh, can you ask that question again? I don't quite understand. So like, you know how the garbage man used to be a guy who would jump out of the truck mm. and he'd grab the garbage mm-hmm. and then they'd load it up. Mm-hmm. I think Empire does that or, d- or Inland. One of those, one of those ones that out in like okay. Fairfield. That it, would probably be Empire. Yeah. One of those places does it. Um, but I don't think so of those three, which ones do it? Is it still just only one? I, I so that actually does that. I think that's true. I know the least about Empire, mm. um, to be honest. I know a lot more about Sunshine and waste management. And then also the, the city of Spokane has their own um, team of garbage collectors as well. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, I think most of the garbage teams have those automated arms because mm. it one it like decreases the risk of injury right workplace Mm -hmm. injury by having to like lift these heavy bins and just moving it around and it just makes it much more efficient so i think you are starting to see more garbage collectors outfitted with those special arms so yeah that makes sense that makes sense so it's been 20 minutes on that so i'll kill the kill the thing so perfect but so this is what I'm thinking. I'm brainstorming some things. So taking, if you could get the glass and bring it to a central repository mm-hmm. and then convert it into just the raw material of the ground down unsharp glass that mm-hmm. can then be used with uh, concrete and asphalt, asphalt. landscaping. I mean, a gajillion so, so things. So basically what you're saying is we are wasting and we're wasting more money Mm -hmm. shipping our trash (laughs) than when we could be doing is taking advantage of this one thing which is the glass and recycling it into a a raw material yes and so my first thought is all right where could you do that? Well, there's plenty of places where yep. you could do that. How big of a grinder do you need for that? Uh, you would probably need like like an area that's like five acres and over time you're no bigger than five acres. Smaller. Smaller it's actually a lot. Acres. Yeah. It's a lot less space I, than you think you need. Because I'm thinking a big old gravel, kind of like a gravel pit, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And with, you know, an arm that just got all the ground glass that goes up into it. And then I think, so how are you going to get people to give you glass? Okay, well, you got to give them containers to put it in the glass. So you can get those containers from fruit sheds Mm -hmm. that have, so they have all these fruit lugs that are plastic fruit lugs. And these plastic fruit lugs usually hold around 25 pounds of fruit. That would be perfect. Yeah. And so they're always shipping they're you know they're getting new lugs getting rid of old lugs so you Mm -hmm. can get old lugs from one of these fruit sheds over in Wenatchee or someplace or maybe some fruit shed that went out of business and you could start on a small scale and you could probably partner with one of those waste management things Mm -hmm. that you talked about and you could say look what would it take if I got it's it's either one of those things where it's like you give every home a thing where they can put their glass and then you give them a dumpster where they can dump their glass. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But at the same time, what if you could 
contract with say waste management or sunshine or any of them Mm -hmm. they're like look once a month could you do a special run through your neighborhood specifically for glass specifically for glass yeah and then you take it here how much would that cost yeah and then yeah float that around to those uh, all of them so we actually so we have a few different possible pathways um, that we've already been thinking a lot about and had some conversations about. One of which is having talked to both um, some people with the waste to energy plant. Um, So the, the city of Spokane does their own garbage and recycling pickup curbside at everybody's house. And next to the waste to energy plant, there is a open to the public recycling center as well that's owned by the city. So they technically collect glass two different ways, right? People could drop it off at the recycling center or they can have it in their um, recycling bin. Those people, as well as some of the people we've talked to with the, the county of Spokane, which is a separate piece. They have two transfer stations, one up north on Elk Chatteroy and one in the valley, Um, are still collecting glass separately and early conversations with them are that if we had a processing facility and we knew where the the glass sanding gravel was going to go we have some end markets that are not going to result in them getting stuck with a pile of glass sand and gravel um, because that a few years ago they were stockpiling glass and then didn't have an outlet for it and it was kind of a nightmare so they they're a little hesitant with people coming in and wanting to say that they're going to do glass stuff because they're like, we just don't want to get stuck with it. But what they had told me is that if we had this facility, we had some end markets already kind of sorted out, that they would actually pay us tipping fees that they're already paying other places um, to drop off their glass with us, which would be awesome. So that's one possibility as far as the part of the collection piece right because that's already it's already being collected in those areas Cheney very similarly they don't they haven't put out a bin for glass in a long time because it was more expensive for them Um, but they're open to it and they're like yeah if you give us one or two months notice we're happy to start collecting glass again Um, so we already have some of that buy-in from some of our local municipalities Um, as far as the actual like processing facility goes where would it be who would you be partnering with we have a couple different options um and we're still working on exploring these but one of them could be like you said with let's say sunshine or um waste management smart center or with the city of spokane you could potentially partner with one of them to have the space to be able to have a um pulverizer and they're actually not that big Um, The kind of gold standard in the U.S. for glass pulverizers um, comes out of New York with a company called Andela. So they've been doing this a long time. Um, That's where those those college students who are, they're not college students anymore, but in in New Orleans, that's their setup. In Chelan, there actually is a um, small glass recycling or glass processing facility. Same thing, they use Andela's machinery. Um, So... It's really not that much square footage. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's it's surprisingly not a lot of space required um, to operate this machinery. And the machinery itself is not all that expensive either. Um, if you wanted to get, we were kind of looking at the mid-range one that would um, potentially run three to five tons per hour. Not that we would be using it all the time, but that with the cost of machinery, delivery to us from New York and their um, setup guy to come and get it set up for us is a little under $200,000, which is kind of surprising for it to be, you know, such a a big piece of equipment. Um, How big are we talking? Yeah. Um, Oh, shoot. I have the specs. I should look it up. Is it 20 feet by 20 feet? It might even be smaller than that. Mm. I'm trying to think because you have a hopper mm-hmm. and then you have a conveyor belt that goes from the hopper up to what's called the trommel. Mm-hmm. So that's where the glass goes in. 
and it has I, I can't remember how many hammers it depends on the size but it has like a bunch of different hammers that are doing the pulverization of the glass oh. it separates out the like caps and paper labels and all that That's from impressive. the glass uh-huh and then it has a little shoot that drops out there's you can have up to three outputs there's one that's just for trash so that paper um the metal caps and things like that will go down one chute a second chute is um the larger aggregate so like your gravel and then the third chute is the sand um so it's really a pretty compact setup like it's not i'm terrible at estimating sizes but it's really not that big um so I, I don't know. I really don't think it would be a lot of space. Um, so you could totally partner with one of the recycling facilities. Like I said, that's what Chelan does. They've partnered with one of their transfer stations there. Um, or, and this is something that we're exploring, um, The I'm working with somebody at Sunshine who's been a, a really fantastic resource for us throughout this. But one of his thoughts was to actually approach some of the like gravel people in town the cement and asphalt people who already have a lot of these big setups where they're dealing with large quantities of sand and gravel and discussing a partnership with them that we maybe have you know a parcel on their land where we have our equipment set up and we have kind of a win-win situation with them Um, because again this is some of the products that they're already using and so if you can decrease that barrier of resistance for them to be able to use it and we have a space to operate. That would be awesome. So those are a couple things. Um, and then it's also scale. So early on, if you wanted to, we're looking at there's a different company imports uh, from Europe these smaller bottle crushers. So you feed it one bottle at a time. So it's not, again, it's not for large scale. But it's only $10,000 compared to close to $200,000. And so we have even talked about, do we start small so that we can kind of get our operations nailed down about, you know, how does the collection process go? Is there any cleaning that we have to do before we pulverize it? Um, And it's also mobile, right? Like, so we could even have like a mobile processing um, operation. And do we start there, show proof of concept to everybody? And while we're doing that, you know, submit our orders to Andela, which is gonna take, you know, at least six months because they they custom make everything in-house in New York. Um, and then have a larger scale process. So like there's there's so many different possible ways that you could do this and it's just a matter of figuring out like what makes the most sense with all of the key players in the area and who who is most interested in being a part of this early on. Sounds like you should do a road trip to Chelan. I oh, have. Okay. I have. How did that go? Great. So I've been there twice, actually. Uh, Julie McCoy is uh, the fabulous woman who runs, um, it's called 911 Glass Rescue. So it's a branch of their Rotary Club, the Rotary Club of Chelan started it. Um, I can't say enough about Julie. She's amazing. But yeah, so they do have um, that set up down there. They only are open Saturdays from 10 to noon for people to drop off glass. So very brief. Um, There's no other time that you can go by. It's just those two hours that they're open. Um, And it's all volunteer driven. Um, And it tends to be a little bit older volunteers, retirees and things like that. Um, But they have a pretty great setup there. And I've picked her brains a lot about different things I actually have two five gallon buckets of their product I have one of five gallon bucket of sand of theirs and one for gravel to kind of show people what this looks like Um, and then the other counterpart on Orcas Island um, they also do something like this Um, Pete is the executive director there of the exchange is what it's called Um, in my understanding I have not had a chance to visit yet definitely want to but the exchange was started to take advantage of things that were throwing away in their community. Um, so looking at the pictures from back when they started, like people would drop off all kinds of different things that they didn't need anymore. So you kind of have that lending library feel or like a uh, thrift store feel, but then they also started doing a lot of the recycling and things like that in their area. Um, so they have um, one of the Andela pulverizers as well. 
And what's unique about their setup is they only want sand. They didn't want gravel. And so they actually have a recirculating conveyor belt that just runs it through a second time so that they only have sand. But um, Pete there has also been very um, willing to talk with us and has, you know, welcomed us with open arms if we want to come visit sometime. So I would definitely love to do that. What grinder do they got? The small one, the ten thousand. They or have the so two hundred thousand dollar one. Yeah, so I don't know what size the exchange has in Orcas Island, but in Chelan, they have the next model down, which is um, one to two tons per hour, mm. and it's not that much cost difference. Um, the reason that we're interested in the three to five tons per hour is because. Well, Spokane's bigger. Well, right. It's bigger. Um, and again, the, the, the cost difference was not that significant that mm. my thought was. And there are some key differences between that smaller scale machinery and then the three to five ton and, and up. Um, that if you wanted to upgrade later, it's more challenging if you start with a one to two ton per hour because some of those... Some of the components mm -hmm. are sized differently, whereas once you start with a three to five ton per hour, if you wanted to upgrade that, it's easier. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, that was some of the, the thought process there. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, yeah, so I guess buyers. Mm -hmm. Where would the buyers be? Yes. Great question. Um, again, I think it depends on what avenue that you go down as far as are we talking whole bottles um we actually had a there's a business in spokane valley called l's tastes and teas and they have um like so they have their their teas that they make but they also make like um cooking oils and balsamic vinegars and things like that that they put in glass bottles and they actually reached out to us when we would posted something on social media saying if you guys had a way to sanitize and like for us to reuse these bottles, we would love that because it kills us that we're having to throw all these bottles away. Mm -hmm. And so I talked with them and they're having to buy, you know, their, their glass bottles from China. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not even, it's not manufactured in the U S. Um, and so that kind of planted the seed of, is that a, a viable route, right? Where we could be sanitizing bottles and then selling them back. Dairies have been doing this forever and still do this. Um, which is interesting to me because they're about the only, like, I don't know if industry is the right word, but they're the only business that I can think of that has continued to be very um, adamant about washing and reusing their, their glass bottles. Um, so that's something we could explore. We haven't talked to a lot of, like, wineries or things like that in the area yet. We just haven't had the time. But that's something we want to to look at is, is this a need? Would they be interested in that? And if so, that's a, a, an avenue we could take. And they even make specialized glass bottle washers out of Canada. Uh, there's a company called Aquatech that makes these really kick-ass um, washers that can wash glass containers from like as little as five milliliters all the way up to like five liters, right? So like huge size difference there. Um, second avenue, like we talked about, was kind of the artist side of things, like helping support our local artists, but also having some revenue coming in through art pieces, um, home goods, things like that, I think could be a viable option. And then as far as the pulverization piece, so local cement and asphalt gravel people, we had talked to Wilbert's Precast Concrete, um, and they're willing to do a qualitative qualitative analysis um, to see if you know once we have glass sand available for them they're down to to try it and see if it works for them with with their um, precast concrete um, and if so they would be more than happy to purchase sand for um, from us um, to be able to substitute up to 20 percent you know in their products um, so I think there are other companies that would probably be interested in that as well. Same thing with like landscapers. Uh, right now, there's a, a big push in the city of Spokane to pivot more towards water sensitive, I'm trying to think of the right word, but um, water preserving landscaping, right? So that we're not using so much of our potable water on 
sod and things like that. And so I think that there's a piece there with the landscaping side of things to be using some of this um, sand, uh, sand and gravel as, you know, landscaping throughout the community. Um, those are a few of the different, I mean, there's, there's so many, my brain kind of spins sometimes when I'm trying to think about all the different outlets, but it's really just a matter of continuing to have these conversations um, and picking a path. And I think that's, that's been a, my, one of my biggest challenges as um, kind of the leader of this nonprofit is what path do we think makes the most sense to start with? Um, Because I don't think you can do all of them at once to begin with, right? I think going down the bottle washing path versus the the artistry path versus the pulverization path, um, you have to pick one to start. So that's something that, um, again, with the Gonzaga students, we've been talking a lot about, about which one do we think makes the most sense at this point in time, given the resources that we have, given the connections that we have, um, and how easy it would be to kind of set up a feasibility trial of whichever one of these that we decide cool how often do you go to the new venture lab yeah so we just started um so i meet with the gonzaga students on thursday evenings for an hour um this was our third session um the first week was kind of just everybody was introduced to everybody all the other businesses that were also selected to work with the Gonzaga students. So I've only had like two active sessions with my team. Um, But there's uh, the project manager is a student who's been in the new venture lab previously. And then we have a team of, I believe there's five, I'm trying to think if there's five or six students um, that come in voluntarily of their own time. They're not getting credit for this. This is an extracurricular activity for them. That's like a resume builder. Um, But so they have weekly meetings and each week uh, the project manager assigns each person a different task to work on before the next week. Um, And he and I had sat down together at the beginning and crafted what's called a scope. So, you know, all the different things that we expect to accomplish on a week by week basis. And um, they're great. Like I am really excited to work with these students. And just yesterday they all came with different parts of the business model canvas that they were working on and also a SWOT analysis. So it was really cool to see each of them share their thoughts about about our organization and like what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are, and opportunity. Like it was just really cool to see that. And I'm super excited to keep working with them throughout the semester. That's cool. They yeah. did a SWOT analysis. That's important. Yes. <laughs> It's a simple analysis, but it's it's so overlooked. Yeah. Because it's uh, it's important to know where you stand. Another one I like it. We already talked about it, is the market perception analysis. It's like where mm. do where will people see this concept of recycling glass at the local level? Mm-hmm in relation to waste management or the other competitors yeah i at the end of the day i feel like like uh, garbage to most people is just garbage Mm -hmm. you know they throw it out they don't think of it unless you get that extra garbage can then it becomes real (laughs) yep then you start to see oh there's space here yep and and i think like the cherry lug like if or the like the fruit lugs like I don't I don't know. I don't know how much glass recycling the average American house mm. has per month. Yeah. I would Im- maybe a cherry lug would start. I think maybe maybe you could give op- them options like do yep. you want more than 2? Yep. Because you know, if you put it in here then you save it on all the other things. Yep. I think when people actually get that physical bin in yes. their hand it becomes it's there real. It, it becomes i i think it's called the uh the it's not it's the paradox of savings it's not and somewhat the paradox of thrift mm-hmm. to where oh i can be more thrifty yeah right now yep. with my actions by putting glass i i feel that if you give people a bin mm-hmm. you will get people putting glass in the bin yep totally. and then it's a matter of 
who's going to pick it up? Where right. are you going to take it? Yep. What are they putting in the glass? Exactly. I, I think about like all the dip bottles of like people putting all their dip spit and stuff. Mm, like, yep. Nope. Clean bottles yeah. only. Or yeah. At least empty empty bottles. That, right? You know? Yeah. But that's, you know, I think with any process, there's going to be hiccups, especially in the beginning, right? Like you're going to think that you've anticipated all of the possible, uh, things that are going to happen and you think you're going to you know set up the processes perfectly to begin with but that's just not going to happen you're going to have people throw you curveballs and that you'll make adjustments to along the way so and it doesn't sound like it's an operation that needs to run nine to five it sounds like it only needs to run maybe twice a week i think so and surprisingly so at Andela in New York, they also have, so they make the machinery, but they also use that machinery. They have a glass processing facility there. Um, and the guy who does all of the setup as well as like maintenance, his name is Dave Spencer or Spence, mm-hmm. cool dude. He operates their equipment himself. It's a, for him, it's a one man job. He's got a loader that, you know, he scoops the glass into, dumps in the hopper and then goes to the other end and scoops up the sand and puts it wherever so he's like if you do it right it's it's a it can be a one person job you don't have to have you know depending on your your capabilities and your capacity like you don't have to have a ton of people to make this a successful and viable option which i think is awesome so it sounds like something you could easily start small yeah if you had uh the support of a logistics system to pick it up right Yep. Even and that's really what that's, it boils down it to. It is the and logistic system. With that too, in in Washington State, there's some interesting considerations too that I I learned about. Um, so, what your goal is with the glass depends on who you need to be to pick it up. What I mean by that is, if your goal is to reuse glass, mm-hmm. so you're not going to make big modification, you're not recycling it, you're reusing it then it's not a waste anymore. It's Mm -hmm. not classified even as a recyclable or or, or a waste thing. And so anybody could pick that up. And you don't need special certifications to pick up people's glass bottles. Mm -hmm. As soon as you're saying you're picking up people's glass waste and that it's for recycling, now you need to have special certification as a waste hauler, Mm. which is regulated by the Department of Transportation. And I think it's called like your CTE or Certificate of... Of course, the government. So it's interesting, right? And one of the gals I talked to was pointing out. So in in Oregon, I guess there's a really great business that provides uh, recycling pickup of kind of odd things that we don't recycle every day. So like batteries, for example, Mm -hmm. that's not something you need to put out every week, right? Most people save up if if they are going to recycle, they're going to be holding on to that for a while before they have Mm -hmm. enough batteries to do something with. So this particular company would put out different, you know, they put out bins, but it was like different things every week that they would pick up, like light bulbs. Again, things that are not massive quantities. And they were super successful out in in Portland. And they decided to expand to like Seattle and and Washington. And because of those laws, um, apparently it's like very territorial. Like not only Mm. do you have to have this special designation, but like there are regions that that are kind of for that hauler and Mm. if you're a different hauler encroaching on somebody else's territory like there are potential legal ramifications for that so this company they didn't get into big trouble but like that was a concern they were kind of called out for like hey you're encroaching on our territory and so that was pretty eye-opening to me to be like oh wow like that that piece is a lot more complicated than I recognized Mm -hmm. and so would require either a special designation just for the glass which is something that again the local government would have to do or coordinating with somebody who's already picking up in that region or that you are only doing you know for reuse so it's 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 a tricky it's a tricky business or you could get it passed as legislation on a local ballot that's true it's true. You you might know a thing or two about that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah, but uh, that uh, that's a cool concept. And so, where do you where do you want it to be in five years? <sighs> I 
struggle with these questions because I'm one of those people that wants it all done now. Mm -hmm. And I can put massive boosts of um, achieving things in a short period of time. So I, I struggle a little bit with those kind of questions. But in five years, absolutely, I want Spokane County's glass processing to be completely nailed down. Like we are fully operational. It's very smooth with how it runs. And I want us to be able to start that branching process into other communities. I, I could see that even being in less than five years, but starting to be at that process of branching out to other states and, and either providing a consulting piece. We haven't figured that out, you know, if we want to do like chapters of the nonprofit in other communities versus we come in as a consultant to these communities to help them establish that because again a, a big part of what's important to us is we're not here to take things away from communities or make it all about us we want to make it about giving these communities an opportunity to build and grow together through turning their waste into both economic and accessible resource opportunities um, so we're not totally sure how that's going to look but that's I would love to see us starting to get um, to have this really nailed down and start to be looking at bringing this to other communities as well. Sounds like it's a totally viable plan, especially the concept of you're saving money by taking your garbage and not hauling it somewhere else yep. and then converting it into a raw material, yep. which then can be resold or remanufactured. Yep. But either way, we're creating a raw material sand. So then I guess would be what would be the next selling point? What makes recycled glass sand better than beach sand? Yeah, great question. So there's two things. One, every, resor every resource is finite, right? And so there's only so much natural sand that we can continue to harvest without having significant repercussions to our communities. And so one of the benefits in my mind is that you already have this resource that's not being used that could be used to supplement the natural sand at a bare minimum. To me, that's a huge benefit, right? Because you're now extending the lifespan of the resources that you need to be able to do what you've been doing. The second thing that I've been thinking a lot about has to do with the landfilling piece. Um, so this isn't necessarily related to sand itself, but just landfilling in general. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., like, we are very privileged that we don't tend to see the landfilling that's going on. We don't see where our garbage is going. It just gets taken away and mm -hmm. people are managing it, right? But we only have so much space to have active landfills. And even in the area, you, you can look this up, this is all public knowledge, but like there are several landfills in Spokane County that are no longer used because they reach a point where they're at maximum capacity mm -hmm. and they have to be closed up and you have to look for another place to do landfilling. And so like mm -hmm. that too is a finite resource that we're not thinking about. And so if you can be decreasing our, our the, the things that we are putting in the landfill, you're increasing the lifespan of the working landfills that we have. Because again, at, at, at some point, you're gonna run into these issues, and I, I think we have to a certain extent, where you have all this garbage, and what are you gonna do with it? And with that as well, when I did a tour of the waste energy plant, um, the woman who gives those tours there, and does a lot of community engagement, talked about how they are running at maximum capacity like all the time at the waste energy plant and there are times especially in the summer where people generate more garbage because they're out and about doing more and more social events and things like that where they they can't process all of the waste and they have to straight up landfill the garbage that comes through and they aren't able to turn that into energy and so to me like we're already at that point where we have too much garbage we just don't see it and we don't talk about it. And so this is one of those pieces that helps us to better manage the resources that we have, not just for our generation, but future generations to come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. 
That is a good point. And it doesn't seem like it would be a hard sell. It's just a matter of how do you maneuver the logistics. Exactly. And that's that's where we're at. Is There's so many possible right ways to go about it and what are what are the ways that you're going to take right like that's so that's where i spend some of my time banging my head against the wall but i would just sell it like our recycled glass sand is better for concrete by 15 percent structural strength <laughs> so you know that that's you have to be careful with that because that's yeah. not true um but one of the things that is true about using like the recycled glass sand and I don't know a ton about the manufacturing of, of concrete but like before you get to cement so cement goes into concrete before you get to cement you have something called clinker I don't really know what it means but it's a material that you have to generate before you can make cement and where the glass sand comes in is you can sub up to 20 percent of clinker before you make cement or you can substitute 20 percent of cement before you get to concrete either way um, the process to make clinker, I guess, is very energy intensive. You have to stick it in a big furnace and, you know, put a lot of energy into it to make it. And so by substituting even 20% of that with something that's already good to go, you're saving energy costs with that. And you're also decreasing your emissions because you're not having to burn and fuel that for as long uh, of a time. Um, so that in and of itself is a bonus, right? The structural integrity piece, there is there is a, a reaction that happens with silica-based glass, which is pretty much every every glass. Um, so the, the reason why we can't do more than about 20% of a substitution is because of this risk of this alkalinization reaction that can happen between um, some of the other chemicals in cement and, and the glass. But they've done a lot of studies on it, and as long as you stick to that 20%, there's no issues. Structural integrity is the same. You know, it's not any worse. Um, so that's kind of that only piece, but I still think it's a definite benefit. So where are these, uh, concrete places that make, that need clinker? I think any, I'm pretty sure any concrete company needs clinker. Uh, well, I mean, I guess they would be your buyers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So we have, again, we have like Central Premix is one of the biggest distributors here, um, manufacturers and distributors here of, of concrete in the area. Um, we just still. So Central Premix is here in Spokane? I believe so. I didn't realize. I didn't. I don't know nothing. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you know <laughs> way more. You have done a lot of research I've done on a lot this. of research. <laughs> yes. Wow. I've done a, I've done a lot. Um, yeah. I, I believe they're here. Um, one of the interesting relationships we're, we're looking to explore. So we're in conversation with the Kalispell tribe um, about their class at Northern Quest. That's still ongoing, so I can't really speak to anything there yet. Um, but right across from Kalispell's Northern Quest is Shamrock Paving. Hmm. Um, so we're really looking at that proximity to one another and would very much like to have some conversations with Shamrock um, about their potential need for sand and gravel and whether or not that could be a viable space to have our production, our, our processing facility there. Um, it's just, we don't have a very big team. Um, I think that's been our biggest challenge. I have a very small board um, of, there's four of us, so it's itty bitty. Um, one of those members is actually in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, but so I, at this point, have been doing a lot of the heavy lifting. I've been doing a lot of the research myself and reaching out to people. Um, and I would really love for us to kind of grow our capacity as far as our people goes, both on our board, starting to get volunteers involved, because I feel like our progress at this point is limited by, by me, by not having... I, I'm kind of the one that's been doing a lot of this. Um, and so the more we can b grow our board and the people that are interested in this and growing with us, um, we can be taking these bigger steps and, you know, moving forward with, with taking action. And um, so it's, that's that. I feel like we're not moving as fast as I'd like to be moving, but 
that's also just my personality of like, mm-hmm. I want it done now. And <laughs> so mm-hmm. we're getting there, but we are, that's where we're, like I said, we're kind of doing everything all at once. We need to grow as an organization. We need to um, get the word out about what we're doing and continue to have those conversations with partners to actually make it happen. So that's quite a passion project that you've bit <laughs> off. <laughs> Yes, it is. I mean, it's it's a it's a unique and fascinating change of life. You go from yes. the world of medicine, yep. and you haven't even touched on that. Yeah. Like, what? <laughs> what did? So, did you realize that's not what you wanted to be when you grew up? You know, what's kind of funny is I. So, my mom's a doctor. Mm-hmm. And I used to swear when I was a little kid that I would never be a doctor like my mom mm-hmm. because she worked so hard. Um, she was, she's an internist by training, but started out in the, in the emergency room. Mm-hmm. So she, in my mind, she was gone all the time, right? And she would have to flip flop between day shifts and night shifts and she was exhausted. And um, she seemed to me growing up very miserable with mm-hmm. how busy she was. And so I was like, I'm never gonna be a doctor. Um, but sometimes, you know, we make decisions out of a need for security and safety and certainty or we're we're trying to get that certainty in life. And for me, you know, I was always really interested in business. I said, like, even when I was in middle school, I wanted to be the CEO of my own company. Um, and I liked art, Mm -hmm. but when I got to college, you know, there was a lot of pressure, um, from the people in my life to play it more safe and not to have more stability, to have more financial security. And I did love biology. And so I went from this dream of being a big business CEO person to, well, biology is really cool too. And, um, you know, my parents are really proud of me for going the biology route and they're, you know, encouraging me to continue with that. And so I went through college. Um, At one point, I was triple majoring in business, bio, and Spanish because I wanted to do everything, but that was too much. So I did um, end up dropping the business major. And by the time I finished college, I was really on the fence because I was like, well, I can either go to medical school and be a doctor, which I said I'm never going to do, or I could go get my PhD in something sciencey and at the time for me it was like either genetics or molecular biology because that's what I really fell in love with and was right on that cusp of of decide even after I'd graduated I still didn't know I was like I don't know but in my mind I felt like those were my only two options I didn't see other possibilities um I kind of blame our system of just kind of passing our kids on to the next thing all the time, right? The way our public education system is K through 12, you're just always moving. And then college, if you don't take a gap year, you're just like, what's the next thing, right? So for me, it felt like I didn't have that space to really explore other opportunities outside of the box. I felt like I had to stay in that box. Um, So I was getting ready to take a job with a lab that was studying bone cancer. And, um, was doing one last summer of research after I'd graduated and the the lab manager was like responding to my emails at like two and four in the morning and I was like what the heck like why is this guy up writing emails to me at two and four in the morning and um, my mentor and the person I worked with um, in the lab in college was like dude you gotta understand like if you do the the research PhD postdoc route right let's say you're married and you have kids you get up take your kids to school at eight, you're into the lab by nine. You're working all day in the lab from nine to 4.35, come home, have dinner with the kids, put them to bed, and then you go back to work. And like, it's a never ending cycle. You have all these grants that you're always having to write, you know, to get funding for your research. And for whatever reason, it was that, that concept of never having a life and always working in the lab and work never being done, For whatever reason, I was like, okay, that's it. I'm applying to med school. So I just, I I still have the email where I emailed the guy back and was like, I really appreciate you, but I've had a change of heart. I'm going to apply to med school. And so I just pivoted on a dime and um, decided to try to apply, even though I was super late in the cycle and um, took my MCAT on the last possible day I could take it and still apply. 
and just put it all out there. And um, I only got one interview, which was with my home state, but I got in and I didn't really look back because I was like, okay, this is the next step that I'm supposed to take, right? And it was comfortable to take the next step and have a plan instead of actually stop and ask myself, what do you really want? Um, so I went down the med school path and I love science. I love a lot of things. Like I, I love learning, I think more than anything else. I feel like I'm, and this is cliche, but I'm a student of life, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was easy to continue that path of being this lifelong learner and being this student. Um, and I do love serving people. Like that's something I've always cared about too. But where I kept struggling, even in med school to a certain extent, and then in residency, was this hierarchy that exists in medicine that is, you know, I'm an attending physician. I'm a, especially like you talk about the surgery world, right? You talk about the neurosurgeons being at the top of the food chain and this concept of I'm better than you. What I say goes, it doesn't matter if you have concerns, like I'm the person in, in authority here. And that really rubbed me the wrong way throughout that process and, and getting into surgery residency. And in med school, you're kind of protected because you're still in that student role, right? And so they have high expectations of you, but like you're there to learn and you're paying them, right? You're paying to go to medical school. But when you get to residency, the tables flip on you because all of a sudden, yes, you're getting salaried now. So you're, you're not a student, they're paying you, but they have all of the power because for you to get your board certification in whatever specialty, so if you want to be a family medicine doctor or a general surgeon or whatever, right? Like you have to finish your residency before you can do that. And in the United States, we don't have enough residency spots. There are more applicants for residency than there are spots. Um, and that's a whole system too of like who's who's more prioritized, who's like a better applicant than others. Or used to be, you have your MD students from the U.S. were like the top of the heap. They were the most sought after candidates, right? And then you have your DO students, which they're still medical students, but it's a slightly different, you know, um, programming. And they used to be less desirable. That's not as much true anymore. And then you have your U.S. residents who went to medical school in the Caribbean or other places, right? They're third on the list. And then fourth is your international medical grads. So people from other countries that did medical school there but want to come to the U.S. for residency. All of those people are competing for the same spots. And that's not counting the people that didn't get in the year before who are now back in that same pool. And so as soon as you get to residency, there's this huge power shift where the residents have no power at all and the hospitals that have the spots have all the power. And I really struggled with that um, at the program that I was at in particular because you were treated like fodder, especially COVID had just started. Um, You know, I graduated in May of 2020 and June of 2020 is when I started in the hospital at a super busy level one trauma center. And not every residency program is this way, but a lot of them are where your training takes a backseat to what they need from you. And also you're replaceable because there's all these other people that didn't get in that, that would love to have your spot. And so that just didn't sit well with me. Um, I've been working since I was 15 years old and, you know, I worked in a grocery store for four years and that was the worst job I'd ever had in my life. I'd never been treated so poorly in my entire life. And to be kind of shot down for when I, when I had concerns about like patient safety or things like that, that you're in medical school, you're like, that's the top priority, right? Like taking good care of patients is what's most important. And when even that, bringing that forward is a threat to the hierarchy and that they'd rather punish you because you brought something that you were concerned about to their attention than actually being open to that. Like that to me was like the the line I couldn't cross and I couldn't stand that that's how our system is. Um, so anyway, that was probably way more than you were expecting. But that that's, I don't know that people ask me a lot, are you ever going to go back? Um, I don't know. 
when I first resigned, it was a strong no. It was like, nope, I'm never going back to finish a residency of any kind. I don't want to be put in that position again. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I never say never. And uh, I am hopeful that that how we practice medical education and in turn how we practice medicine is going to continue to change over the years and and improve and I think we're, we're starting down that path but I think it's going to be a long path um, and I don't know as much as I love nerding out I still love nerding out about medical stuff and uh, I tell my friends I feel like I have a mental Rolodex mm -hmm. of my health knowledge they'll be like hey I have these symptoms like what do you think it could be and you know I'm not giving medical uh, advice but you know we get to kind of uh, use some of that knowledge and it's fun and it's it's a privilege it's a tremendous privilege to be able to take care of people um, when they're at their most vulnerable and the, some of the worst places in their life but I don't know that that's where I'm meant to be um, so we'll see yeah my youngest brother is trying to get into medical school he's been a He's a flight paramedic. For oh, wow. Flight. Yeah, dang. Yeah, he's very dead set on getting into medical school. He hey. wants to be a doctor. Good for him. And but yeah, good on him. Yeah, I, we need, and I tell this, to, I, I actually, after I quit, I, <laughs> this is kind of ironic, but I was uh, teaching MCAT prep courses mm -hmm. to pre-meds. Yeah, he was yeah yeah but I, we need we need good doctors right and we, we need people that want to be there um so i always tell people that like are interested in medicine that like just make sure that is what you want because it's especially the debt like before i went to medical school i didn't have any student loans i was super privileged and between my scholarships and my parents like college was paid for but to like i have i have two hundred thousand dollars in student loans for medical school and it's a big weight to have on you if you decide that's not what you want to do. And even for practicing physicians, it takes years, you know, to pay off your student loans with all that delayed gratification. A lot of doctors fall into like splurging and getting really fancy stuff because they've been living so meagerly for so long. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, I just... I. I don't discourage people from doing it, but I, I do try to be realistic with them about like, just make sure you know why you're doing it, that it's it's for you and not for somebody else. Like it's not, you can't do it for your parents. You know, you can't do it because you wanna be um, prestigious or like whatever, like you have to do it for you. And that's, that's the only way you're gonna get through the crap that's gonna get thrown at you because there is a lot of crap. Oh, yeah. Well, he's definitely a nerd about it. He opens my eyes to things I didn't realize. Well, now he mostly works for Life Flight, so it's like the real serious things. Yeah, but totally. But before, and he still loosely works with the local paramedic company because yeah. it's his, he says it's his place to incubate, yeah. to innovate people, you know? Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, incubation's uh, wild. But he, uh, he told me about people who vagal out. Mm -hmm. I, I thought that was funny about bageling out. Yeah, yeah. There's a, the human body is a fascinating specimen. I I don't know. It's yeah, yeah. And I saw some pretty gnarly stuff during my year of surgery. I'm not gonna lie. It was it was interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but I don't think it's wasted. I think no. that like your time learning and becoming a continuous absorber of information is, you know, something that's going to pay dividends. And I think maybe if you would have just listened to your intuition back in the day, you should have dropped the Spanish class as a major and just kept with business. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, that's possible. I do like Spanish. I got to study abroad. I really enjoyed it. But oh, cool. Where? Yeah. Have you, what countries have you been to? Um, I've actually been to a fair number. My parents, my mom in particular, loves traveling. So ever since I was a little kid, um, I've been super privileged to get to go on adventures with her. Um, like one of the coolest places I've ever been was Egypt. Oh, really? That was awesome. Yeah. Um, we went when I was in middle school and it was just phenomenal, especially that, that contrast between ancient Egypt and like getting to see all the, the tombs and, um, the obelisks and like the pyramids and all that. And in contrast with 
how Egypt is now, and that that there's also this stark contrast in in wealth and poverty there too. That's like very in your face. So it's a f- really fascinating um, country to get to explore a little bit and, and see how they're living. And um, but yeah, in so in college, I studied abroad in Costa Rica for a hold semester. So, so Egypt. Yeah, Egypt. <laughs> you're just like, oh, wait, I'm I've still there. T- I'm still in on. Egypt. Hold I've on. never talked to. A woman that's been to the Middle East that uh, as a tourist. So did you have to cover your hair? Um, Not everywhere. If we went into mosques, yes. Like, definitely. They so, allowed you in a mosque? Oh, yeah. Totally. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, So we went actually as part of a... So my parents one of their religious professors from back in the day um or religion professors wanted to take this trip and so it was partially like getting to see cool different aspects of religion in egypt so the the mosques and also from a christianity perspective you have the coptic christians um which we don't talk a lot about in the u.s because yeah um so we got to see different monasteries i actually got to meet the coptic pope which is wild um and then a few different mosques. So it was, I felt pretty safe at the time. This was before, it was kind of the sweet spot, honestly. I think I'm, I feel really lucky that we got to go and we did because we went before there was a lot of political unrest. Um, I can't remember the timeline of, mm-hmm. I'm kind of terrible at dates, but like, I think we hit that perfect time where it was fairly safe for us to be there especially in the group that we were in we had really knowledgeable awesome tour guides um but it was interesting especially like at that age that I was like I said I was in kind of like mid to late middle school I think it was like an eighth grade or something Mm -hmm. and like different dudes would ask my parents for my hand in marriage which Mm. is like really trippy and like would offer camels you Mm -hmm. know in exchange (laughs) for me and so it was like it was it was an interesting uh interesting experience at that age but it was it was a really awesome trip though yeah well those camels are not cheap it's true those camels it's true <laughs> so when i was in uh, when i was in the marines we trained in this place called udari range okay and kuwait and so this was in the country of kuwait okay so i've been to a bunch of countries but um cool. so we were training in kuwait and the Kuwaitis would charge us if we were to... Sh- so, on this on this range, Udari range, there are camel Bedouins. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Out, sometimes they would have their camels out in the range. Mm-hmm. And so, we would have to drive out and herd their camels <laughs> so off the sh- of the range <laughs> online with the Humvees just to try oh my to... Gosh. Yeah, Yeah, just to herd the camels <sighs> off of the range. You're like, we, we need to practice. Excuse because me. Because <laughs> if we shot or killed one... <laughs> They were two hundred and fifty thousand dollars each. What? Yeah, that'll pay for your grinder. Dang. Yeah, that'll oh grind some glass. That's like two hundred fifty grand for a camel. I know. That's wow. what. We, so, yeah, just That's know impressive. that. Okay, they're, so you're they, like, they aren't hey, cheap. they they offered your parents a good deal. No. <laughs> yeah, that's probably what they're charging our government. I doubt a camel, but I mean, but these camels were big. These aren't yeah. like the ones you would see. Yeah in uh the one u.s the ones in the u.s are like small they out here right kind of sickly these are like <laughs> massive caravan camels yeah but they they were interesting okay so more about uh egypt so talk about the pyramids in touring the valley of the kings or the dead or whatever yeah what was that experience like? i just it was i'd always been really interested in um you know, ancient Egyptian culture and history. And so it was so cool to be able to actually see the things that I'd read about in, Mm -hmm. in textbooks and, and books and, um, and how well a lot of it is still preserved. Like, especially in some of these places where you don't have natural light getting into, like you can still see the paint on the walls, like Mm -hmm. there's pigment to it. And you can imagine in, in a lot of the, like documentaries and stuff that we see now of places it looks it's all one color right it's like kind of brownish gray but like in some of these areas you can see that paint and you recognize that like all of it was painted 
like and imagining how vibrant that would have been and just like how ornate everything was and the sheer size of everything right you have these huge freaking obelisks and you're like how did they do that with such precision too without the kinds of tools that we we have available to us today um and again that stark contrast a lot of the pictures of the the pyramids the way people take it you don't see the city but it's like they're right next to each other like the the pyramids and the sphinx and all that are right next to to cairo right Mm -hmm. and so um that proximity is just so striking to see this ancient stuff and then these big you know towers and buildings and hustle and bustle of the city um i don't know i think it was really amazing um some of the coolest things that (laughs) you're gonna laugh because this was not planned but one of the coolest places we went to is actually like the garbage collector city i'm seeing why this is ironic now but it was so cool because there was one specific i don't know if it was a neighborhood versus a, a like little town that did a lot of the, the processing of, of different trash and recyclables there. Um, but in that city, they had carved into a mountain this this church. And it was just so striking because, like, literally, they, they carved out of this mountainside this, like, amazing space to come together um, amidst all this trash. Like, it just was really, like, striking. And then also there, I think in that same city, was... Um, these nuns had an orphanage that they would take care of um, obviously like babies and kids but then they also would take care of like the elderly that didn't have a place to be like people that were struggling with dementia or things like that Um, and that like that was also there in this like city of trash so it's just like I don't know that that contrast was just so incredible to see to see people to some people to outsiders view of like living in filth right like you're living in this trash community but then to have these like beautiful sacred spaces there and to have that that compassion and it just was pretty Mm mind-blowing yeah yeah it is to see the stark reality in class differences and then you know but still people it, it, it it's cool to see that stuff it and and instead of because sometimes I think, especially as a tourist, sometimes you see poverty and it's you see these people that are begging in the streets, right? Like asking for things. And But to actually get to see a little bit of what their life is like and not that... I'm not saying that begging is performative. That's not what I'm trying to say. But like to actually see what, what their life is like in the day-to-day and how they're living and also how how often they're very grateful for things um i think there was there was like a study a while back that discussed how people with less actually are more giving and more generous Mm -hmm. than people that have more money Mm -hmm. um and they did this really interesting study where they gave people like five or ten bucks or whatever and they could either give it to somebody else that needed it or they could keep it themselves and the people that were more in poverty tended to give it to somebody else instead of keeping it Mm -hmm. um but so it's humbling to see people who have so much less than than you do for example or that you know that that many of us have and to find joy in their day and to find appreciation for what they have and to be grateful and to smile and to genuinely feel you know appreciative of the things that they do have um, I think is something that we often miss out on Mm -hmm. Um, so well you're coming from multiple places when you're talking you're thinking not only Egypt you're thinking Costa Rica what other countries have you been to yeah so um when I was in high school, I got to do a really cool band tour um, of Europe. So we, it was like only a few days in each place, but it was still really cool. So we went to London, Paris, uh, Rotenburg, Germany. Um, we went to, got to spend it uh, like a half a day or you know most of a day in, in um, Venice. Um, there's Innsbruck, Austria. And then I got to end in Greece, which was amazing. Athens. I got to to end up in Athens. That was, like, stunning. Um, I've gone to Peru, also a phenomenal country. 
Um, You've been to Peru? Yeah. Highly recommend. Yeah, I want to go. I want to go free the guinea pigs. I know. (laughs) The Kui. Yes. They call them Kui there. They call them Kui? Kui, yes. Um, Yeah. I'm trying to think of what they're... Because they have an indigenous language um, that I'm blanking on. But in their indigenous language, it's called Kui. And we... (laughs) Our tour guide, who was actually... Well, he was like a bus driver. Or not bus driver, but a... Uh, our driver Mm -hmm. right because again it was a small group of us um our tour guide got held back in um lima because he was waiting for his wife and i was the only one of those of us that were there that spoke spanish so the driver and i were chatting and like he became our tour guide while our actual you know leader was behind and at one point towards the end of our trip he actually like took us to his house to meet his parents and like we got to see his chickens and his guinea pigs and like we were kind of like having this joke about how in in the u.s we're like these are pets and he's like no dude they're food you know so yeah i did not try any qui while i was there i couldn't do it they're just too cute yeah and they also dress them up (laughs) you know it there's a certain time of year i've seen this it looks cute as shit because they they dress them up in little outfits. Do and they some really? Bra- yeah, and sombreros But and then stuff. they eat them. Yeah, and then oh, they eat brutal. them afterward, which it's is brutal. cruel. I know. But, but we, we all got to eat, so. Yeah, I guess they just see it different. I And uh, those ones are my favorite. I love guinea pigs. They're so cute. Yeah, they are. They are they're, cute. They're I, I had hamsters. guinea pigs for a while. I had, <laughs> oh, like, right on. Yeah, I was a pig farmer. Duh, what? For a bit. I was, yeah. That's um, crazy. Yeah, I had, went through four litters of pigs. And wow. Yeah, it's not hard to have litters of pigs. Dang. Because they're rodents. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. But uh, so so did you see Machu Picchu? Oh, yeah. Okay. Also amazing. Again, that craftsmanship. You're like, how did they do this? Especially where it is, up in the freaking mountains, right? You're like. It's aliens, right? I I don't know, man. But like, phenomenal. That's cool. Phenomenal. Yeah. I would think so. Of the two, which one did you like more? Ancient you can't compare. Egypt? You yeah, can't okay, compare. Yeah, that would be not fair to I compare do, but them I just at don't, all. Like, like genuinely, like they're so different, and mm-hmm. they each have such a rich culture that like you, you just can't compare them. How long did the bus ride take to get up to Machu Picchu? I don't remember. Yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. But we did, apparently, if you're going to go to Peru the way that you deal with the altitude sickness because this is a very real thing there okay one you take altitude sickness meds before you go and Do they leading make up you to it drowsy? no but they make your taste buds weird like okay. it's very strange um like my parents didn't realize it was going to change your sense of taste so every time they'd like drink their soda they'd be like this soda's gone bad what's wrong and you're like no no, no that's that's the medicine it's messing with your taste buds anyway so you you take altitude sickness pills prior to and then while you're there you usually fly into lima because it's their international airport but then you start your trip at a lower altitude and then work your way back up to lima um so that's what we did and that was the way to do it so highly recommend factoring in the altitude as part of your part of your trip okay so that's cool yeah super cool that's cool that must have been something it was amazing and even just seeing the different communities like we started in a really small community called Ollantaytambo um and kind of getting their local feel and then we went to Cusco which is also a pretty big city it's not mm-hmm. as big as Lima but like in seeing their um architecture and um art and all that and then ending up in Lima which is like the most modern part of it so yeah I uh- I want to go there one day and I want to get with those jugs that you put the water in and that makes noises. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, there's all kinds of great. Yeah. The textiles and like oh, the craftsmanship in Peru. It's great. I, I think I got a hammock while I was there. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's great stuff. So, what was the exchange rate for a dollar per peso also, or I whatever? I don't remember yeah. either. Uh, I don't remember what they're called. I think colognes are in Costa Rica. I can't remember what the the currency is in Peru. I think it was, I mean, obviously the, uh, I shouldn't say obviously, but 
the U.S. dollar went more mm-hmm. than the local Peruvian uh, equivalent. Um, but I don't, I don't recall what it was at the time. Cool. So what? So you said you went to Greece. Mm-hmm. What was that like? Athens was very cool. Again, all of these places, it's like that contrast, right? Mm-hmm. Of like this, this, this ancient. Uh, these ancient structures and then and how people are living there now. I really liked um, in, in Athens, there's a kind of town square called the Plaka, mm-hmm. which is where all of these vendors come together to sell things. And so like, that was really cool. And we, we like walk through the Plaka was every it day. Under pillars, like ancient Greece. I don't, I think with, they were like tents and stuff, oh, you know, yeah. um, in between the pillars. but it was, it was, and you have kind of your gimmicky stuff. Um, they sell for like tourist stuff but then they also had like amazing obviously that olive oil and stuff was like oh godly Mm -hmm. but that was cool um having all those different vendors um the parthenon amazing absolutely amazing the view from there is just really gorgeous um and this is a random fun fact that i learned but like all of the stray cats and dogs there are kind of viewed as like communal stray cats and dogs. Mm-hmm. So they do actually the government funds to have them like spayed and neutered. Mm. Um, and everybody feeds them. And like they're kind of like the whole city's pets, which I think is really fascinating. I'm like, that's so cool. But That is cool. Yeah. <laughs> Random factoid that you didn't know you needed to know. <laughs> in some ways i kind of feel like that's the way dogs right. kind of want to do it yeah mm-hmm. totally they want to be everybody's pet you know they're like oh i'll get some love from you and then i'll come over here yeah. and, yep totally cool so uh what other countries have you been to so many um well not that many really like i say that like else have i been i've been to some of the more uh, the, a little bit closer i haven't been to canada or mexico which is insane to me i'm like come on they're so close why haven't mm-hmm. you been there um when i was in costa rica i had a chance to visit nicaragua and panama briefly not for very long i wish i could have spent longer there um saint martin the caymans um I have had, I have not gone yet, but I've had several invitations to go to Kenya and I really need to do that. Um, so I'm hoping to do that in the next couple of years. I think that'd be really amazing. And I also have um, a friend who lives in New Zealand who's invited me. So I'm hoping to get over there too. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah. Other than I just a few, like I said, a few different countries in, in Europe. Um, already, I went to, I went to Vienna a few years ago for a conference Um, which was pretty neat um and then my mom and i went to italy oh my gosh hold on is vienna france or italy vienna vienna is austria okay wow that's so horrible (laughs) of an american that's okay i I just know it's hold on which one of those cities is the one uh see this is how horrible i am that's okay i'm thinking of the city with the though the the like the venetian with the the Venice, the Venice, Venice is in Italy. Yep. Venice is Venice in is Italy. Italy. Vienna and, is in Austria. And Vienna. Okay, and Vi- Vienna is like the why. the like birthplace of a lot of like phenomenal yes. musicians, gotcha. right? Yeah. Um, and the, the Habsburgs. If you're a history nut, which I'm not, but if you're a history buff, the Habsburgs were out of Austria. Um, anyway, exciting stuff. Um, but yeah, no, my mom and I went on a trip to Italy. Um, while I was in medical school and we got to see Rome and we mostly spent our time in Rome and Florence and um, a little bit of time in a, a town called Siena which was beautiful um, yeah I don't I don't know I feel very very lucky to have gone to as many places as I have and hope to go to even more so mm-hmm. yeah where do you want to go next I kind of want to go to Sweden <laughs> to okay. check out their whole process because I just am so fascinated yeah. by um, all the things that they're doing. Um, and that town, ta- I cannot believe I can't remember the name of it, but the town that has the secondhand mall that I was telling you about that has this more beefed up um, waste management process, they were one of those communities that was like super poor, right? Like that had been previously like very industrial and then things changed 
and they became a much more economically depressed community. And so for them to then become world renowned for both their recycling and this secondhand mall thing, Mm -hmm. um, I think is so cool. Um, Also why I like watching, I don't know if you've watched like Welcome to Wrexham. Mm, no. Oh man. Um, so Ryan Reynolds and um, John Mac. I'm gonna butcher his last name, which everybody does. But McEnroy, Matt McEnroy. I don't know. They um, bought a football team in Wales, in Wrexham, Wales, um, a soccer. few years ago. Yeah, soccer. Yeah, but yeah, they call it football. Yeah. You know. Um. And they have a documentary, like a docu series on it. And there's two seasons. They're they're currently putting out the second season right now, which is so good. And it's that same. It's like they used to be a thriving community, um, and they were a mining town, lots of industrial stuff. And then just over time, right, things, the mines closed. A lot of the industry got outsourced, or is not as much of a thing anymore. Um, and their big thing with their their soccer or football team, whatever you want to call it. Um, they used to perform at like the, the premier league, which was like the professional level, like paid and sponsored and all that stuff. And they got relegated and knocked down to below the premier league basically. And for the last like 15 years have stayed there. Um, and despite being this really scrappy town, like just have had so many hard knocks. And so it's a great docu series about about bringing hope back into this community again um, through purchasing this this sports club and how even just like the exposure from this docu series, you know, has caused them to explode economically and and um, for them to have a lot more pride in their community. So I love I love stories like that. That is good. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what else, what do you, what are you thinking is the next step? Um, well today, my next step, I probably got to get going cause I oh, think okay. my parking meters probably expired. Yeah. Unfortunately. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah. that's my immediate next step is unfortunately I probably got to get going. Okay. Well that's fine then. Um, so where can people find you? Oh yes. Great question. Um, so we do have a website. It's letsbuildacommunity.org. You can hop on there. There's not a lot on there right now, but more coming. Um, you'll find our email address on there as well. Um, social media, we're Let's Build a Community. Um, so like Facebook, it's Let's Build a Community. Yep. Same Facebook, uh, Instagram. In, in we're on TikTok. I, we're not. Again, we are still but, working. But on you our... personally, though, you're on LinkedIn. Oh yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me on TikTok. I have my own account that I've been having fun with for the last year um, at Adventures of Doctor Jess. Okay. Because uh, I like to go on adventures. But yeah. That sounds fun. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, I will be sure to put all those links in the video description below. Everybody check out her stuff. Be sure to check out the website. Thank you for listening. Like, subscribe, smash that bell, and bye. Thank you.